Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Toromona. The Toromona are a group of people who are indigenous to Bolivia and they live near the upper Madidi River, which is a part of the Amazon basin, and the Heath River in the northwestern area of Bolivia. There hasn't been any notable contact with this tribe aside from other indigenous tribes, but this tribe was talked about a lot when a Norwegian biologist searched specifically for this tribe for many years before he mysteriously disappeared in the region of the Madidi Park in 1997. This tribe has remained quite isolated and the most recent known sighting in the 21st century was when the Arona people of Bolivia informed an anthropologist named Michael Brohan that they had contacted a group that was in voluntary isolation on the eastern bank of the Marini River. It wasn't confirmed that this was the Toromona tribe, but it is believed that that's who they saw. Thankfully in 2006, Bolivia's administrative resolution created an exclusive, reserved and untouchable portion of the Medidi National Park in order to protect the Toromona and their desires to be uncontacted. In our number 9 spot today we have the Kawahiva. The Kawahiva peoples used to be referred to as the Rio Pardo Indians and they are an uncontacted tribe that resides in Mato Grosso, Brazil. This group is definitely nomadic people and so most of what we know about them comes from the things they leave behind when moving to a new place such as arrows, baskets, hammocks and their communal houses. It is unclear exactly when the Kawahiva people became a tribe as our knowledge of their modern existence began in 1999, but it is believed that this group goes as far back as the 1700s. As I mentioned before, they live in communal houses and they use a primitive form of a spinning wheel in order to make string and they use tree bark to make nets. It is very rare for a non-indigenous group to have a sighting of the Kawahiva and neighboring tribes refer to them as either tiny people or redheads. It is believed that loggers in the area have intentionally tried to keep the Kawahiva on the run and it is speculated by the human rights group Survival International that the women of the tribe have stopped giving birth. It is unclear exactly how many Kawahiva people there are left, but it is estimated to be around four separate Kawahiva bands with maybe around 15 people in each band. Like many of the tribes on today's list, their existence is always threatened by deforestation, illegal logging, and just attempts to either kill or enslave them. In 2001, the tribe's land was put under local protection, but that protection was periodically removed by the courts before being later reinstated. And in 2012, the land was turned into an official Official reservation. In our number 8 spot today we have the Carabao. The Carabao are a group of uncontacted people who live in the Rio Pure National Park in the southeastern corner of Colombia. The Carabao live in at least three longhouses which are usually narrow single room houses. They share this national park with both the Pase and the Jumana peoples. In the last 400 years there has been outsider contact with the Carabao people but not much as the contact usually involves violent attacks by slave traders and rubber extractors which has only increased their desire for isolation, which makes a lot of sense. It is believed that these people may refer to themselves as the Yakumo, and there truly isn't much that is known about them, which honestly is probably a good thing. In December of 2001, the president, Juan Manuel Santos, signed legal decree number 4633, which was designed to guarantee uncontacted people's rights to their voluntary isolation, their traditional territories, and even reparations if they face violence from outsiders, which really is such a great thing. While this decree alone of course isn't going to stop some people from illegal contact, it is nice to see that steps are being made to protect these people. In our number 7 spot today we have the Namole or the Namol, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this one. The Namole people are an indigenous tribe of nomadic hunter gatherers who inhabit the remote regions of a national park in Peru which is part of the Amazon rainforest. They are more commonly referred to as the Mashkopiro people but that name was first used in 1687 to refer to those who are native to Peru, but it's actually considered a derogatory term considering the word mashko means savages. In 1998, there was estimated to be around 100 to 250 members of this tribe, which was a welcomed increase from the 1976 estimate of somewhere from 20 to 100. The Namale peoples have 
actively avoided any contact with non-indigenous people and truly who could blame them. In 1894 most of this tribe was slaughtered by the private army of Carlos Fitzgerald who was a rubber baron. Those who survived this attack retreated to the most remote forest areas where they could be safe. In the 21st century there's been an increase in the sightings of people from this tribe but they certainly still are not actively seeking any contact with the outside world. In our number 6 spot today we have the Dalala. The Dalala are an indigenous people of Brazil living in the lower Valle do Javari in the western Amazon basin. These peoples are split into two groups, one splinter group led by a woman named Maya that is around 23 people while the larger main group is around 150 people. The split between the groups came from a dispute between around 20 members and while the larger group remains quite isolated, the smaller group has had some infrequent contact with neighboring settlements. The hunting and war weapon of choice of this tribe is the club, but they are also known to use poison darts. Both the men and women of this tribe paint themselves with red dye that is made from plants. There is little that is known about their religious or spiritual practices, but it is known that they live in communal huts, which is something that is different from many of the uncontacted tribes on today's list. This tribe is more often referred to as the Korubo people, but apparently this name was given to them by a former enemy tribe and is said to be negative and degrading, which is why we will be referring to them by the less common name of Dalala. This tribe's biggest struggle in terms of illness and death at the moment seems to be malaria. This tribe has a long history with the massacres of indigenous peoples, so it makes sense that they want to remain isolated and have not welcomed outside contact very much since the 1950s. In 1996, there began expeditions to try and make peaceful contact, but the Dalala are known to kill trespassers on their land, which we truly cannot blame them for, and the most recent incident of this nature came in 2000 when three lumbermen were killed near the native reservation. It definitely serves as a reminder to leave people who don't want to be contacted alone. If they want our influence, they know where to find us. In our number 5 spot today we have the Aorio. The Aori people are the indigenous people of Gran Chaco and they live in both Bolivia as well as Paraguay. There are approximately 5600 Aorio peoples and while many of them ended up becoming sedentarized by missionaries in the 20th century, there are around 100 people who have still maintained the traditional nomadic hunter gatherer lifestyle and remain uncontacted. The Aorio were first contacted by Jesuits in the 1720s to try and convert people to Catholicism and in the 1740s the mission was abandoned and the Aorio were luckily left alone. Until the 1900s. The Chaco War between Bolivia and Paraguay brought in 100,000 troops to the territory as well as all of the diseases they carried. Both countries saw the Aorio as a problem and from the 1940s to the 1970s there was a rule where a Paraguayan soldier could be freed from service by killing one of them. At this time Aorio children were also being stolen and one 12 year old was even put on display in an exhibit. In the 1940s and 50s the work of missionaries continued and in the late 50s missionaries used force and manipulation to remove the Aorio from from their land to various mission stations, and the land where they once lived was sold for cattle farming. These mission stations forced the Aorio living in them to give up their culture, including their religion, appearance, music, and diet, and missionaries sometimes convinced the Aorio living at the missions to find uncontacted Aorio in the forest to sedentarize and convert them. And in December of 1986, that unsurprisingly turned out to be a horrible idea that led to five deaths. The Aorio people who are in contact now are struggling with both poverty as well as discrimination and the uncontacted Aorio have six main threats which are cattle farming and deforestation, sale and allocation of their territory, searches for oil, missionary seeking contact, illegal collection of territory resources, and violation of territory by various groups. I could dive into each of these points and discuss why they are such a threat to these people, but I'll leave that for your homework because we have got to keep this list moving right along. In our number 4 spot today we have the Tagari. The Tagari are an eastern Huayorani people living in the Ecuadorian Amazon basin. This group was once a part of the Huayori families, but they separated off in 1968 after refusing missionary settlement and since then have lived in isolation. Their name comes from one of their members, Tag. There haven't been many interactions since then with other Huayorani, but the interactions that have happened are often met with violence. It is estimated that there are around 20 to 30 surviving Tagari, and they are one of the two 
remaining indigenous groups living in voluntary isolation in Ecuador. These people are semi nomadic and live off hunting and gathering as well as a few crops. Since 2007, there has been a national policy to try and help protect them that includes untouchability, self determination, equality, and no contact. The threats to the Tagheri include illegal loggers of tropical hardwood, foreign disease, smugglers, settlers, and oil companies moving into the area with drilling taking place all over their land. In 2008, investigations began into reports that five Tagheri people had been killed by illegal loggers. As we get closer to the end of our list, it becomes abundantly clear that many of these isolated tribes face extremely similar threats, which is quite interesting and unfortunately extremely unsurprising. In our number three spot today, we have the Taromani. Remember in the last point about the Tagheri, how I mentioned that they were one of the last two uncontacted tribes in Ecuador? Well, this is the other one. These people live in the Yasuni National Park in the Ecuadorian Amazon Basin, and this tribe also has some distant relations to the Hue Orani people. There's estimated to be around 150 to 300 people in this tribe who maintain their nomadic lifestyle in the rainforest. While, like everyone else on their list, two of their main threats are oil developments and illegal loggers, the Taromanane have another a more unexpected threat, and that is the Huayarani. In 2013, more than 20 of these people were killed by the Huayarani, which left two child survivors who were taken as hostages. Apparently, the people who took part in this terrible tragedy bragged about it on national television at first, calling themselves brave for attacking and taking the lives of unarmed people with rifles, pistols, and long spears, and even went as far as selling photos of it to the highest bidder. There's so much to cover in regards to this one incident that I unfortunately don't have time for, but the whole situation is extremely tragic and just downright horrible. Much of these disputes stem from the land that they share because of the fact that the Taromanane have been pushed deeper into the forest from the Huayarani allowing oil companies to drill on the land. It of course is a very complicated issue that has so much more to it. In our number 2 spot today we have the Awa, our group of people living in the eastern Amazon rainforest. There are around 350 living members but not all of them remain uncontacted. Out of the 300 150, it is believed that around 100 members continue to try to remain uncontacted, although it unfortunately hasn't been as easy as it should for them. The Awa were once settled people but began to live a more nomadic lifestyle around the 1800s in order to try and escape incursions by Europeans. They were further threatened by settlers who cleared out most of the forests on their land. In 1982, the Brazilian government received a loan of 900 million US dollars from the World Bank and the European Union, but under a condition that the lands of certain certain indigenous peoples, including the Awa, be protected. This should have been the key to helping protect these peoples considering their lives were continually being threatened. There were many cases of tribespeople being killed by settlers, and the forest on which they depended was being destroyed by logging and land clearance for farming. Unfortunately, it took the government over 20 years to actually act on this condition, and finally in March of 2003, the Awa's land was finally distinguished. And to make matters a little worse for these peoples, there are always people who won't respect their land, no matter what laws are in place. In late 2011, illegal loggers burned an 8 year old Awa girl alive after she wandered out of her village, and a leader from another group of people said that the girl had been killed as a warning to other native peoples living in the protected area. According to the human rights organization that campaigns for the rights of indigenous tribal peoples, Survival International, the Awa are the earth's most threatened tribe. The Awa forests are still disappearing faster than any other area in the Brazilian Amazon and loggers still remain as their biggest threat. No industry or amount of money is worth these people's lives and their way of life, and serious action to protect them needs to be taken before it's too late. In our number one spot today, we have the man of the hole. This one is quite different from the others on this list because not only is this only one man, but we don't actually know the name of the tribe that he belongs to. It is believed that he may be the last known survivor of his people who were probably all killed by cattle ranchers, which is absolutely devastating. Because of the fact that we do not know his name, what tribe he belongs to, or even what language he speaks, his nickname, the man of the hole, comes from the large holes he digs, which are created to trap animals, as well as a place for him to hide, but it is also believed that these holes may have had a spiritual significance to the tribe that he belongs to. His isolated existence first became known in 1996, and it is believed that the other members of his tribe were killed in a number of clashes between the 1980s and the 1990s. One expert explains that, quote, he should not be seen as a recluse hiding from society. The man is the survivor of genocide. 
He didn't choose to live alone. He lives in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil and in 2007 the Brazilian government declared that the 31 square mile area around him would be off limits to trespassing and development and an additional 11.5 square miles was later added to that. He is often monitored from afar in order to prevent any unwelcome guests from entering his land but despite these attempts he was still attacked by gunmen in 2009 and thankfully managed to survive like the warrior that he absolutely is. He maintains avoiding contact with others although he does know that he is being monitored. The Brazilian government's protection agency, FUNAI, will periodically leave him gifts of tools and seeds, and he will sometimes signal to observing teams so as to warn them of the holes he dug, so it seems as though there's some sort of trust that has been built there, which really is a nice thing to hear. In 2018, the FUNAI released a video of him with the intention of raising global awareness of the threats that face the uncontacted peoples in Brazil, and he appeared as though he may be somewhere in his 50s but seemed in very good health. At number 10 is the Sentinelese, which I'm getting out of the way now as this tribe is a fan favorite on this channel. Inhabiting North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal, these tribal people have maintained an unwavering resistance to their interactions with the outside world. Their stance is clear. They'll go to extremes to protect their isolation, even taking lethal measures against trespassers. The Indian government recognized the importance of leaving them be, designated by the island's tribal reserve in 1956, essentially saying, hands off everybody. Estimating their population isn't easy, naturally, with figures ranging from 15 to 500 individuals, but the probable range is about 15 to 200. These hunter-gatherers rely on bows and arrows for wildlife hunting and seafood gathering. Agriculture role in their lives remain uncertain due to our lack of insight. And although brief contact was established in 1991, visits all halted in 97. Despite our curiosity, respecting their desire for solitude ultimately takes precedence. If you're enjoying this video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Most Amazing, and ringing that notification bell. At number 9, the Awa Tribe. With a known population of roughly 350 individuals, their story is one of resilience and struggle against the encroaching tide of modernity. Despite efforts by about 100 AWA members to remain uncontacted, their isolation has been compromised over the years. Escaping European incursions in the 1800s, they transitioned to a nomadic existence, seeking sanctuary amidst the forest embrace. Their fight for survival took a promising turn in 1982 as the Brazilian government secured funding for their protection, but bureaucracy's languid dance delayed action for over two decades. Tragedy looms as illegal lodgers devastate their habitat and even a young Awa girl met an unimaginable fate at their hands. Survival International, a human rights organization, warns that the Awa stand as the most threatened tribe globally. As their forest sanctuary vanishes at an alarming rate, the urgency for action intensifies to safeguard this tribe. At number 8 is the Moxa Titu, one of the few remaining uncontacted tribes within the Yanomami people. This group resides in a forest region riddled with illegal miners. Their untouched existence harbors profound significance echoing the heritage of their Yanomami counterparts. Reports from contacted Yanomami mention the sporadic sightings of Moxatitu, yet their isolated haven is under dire threat. The swarm of illegal miners introduces lethal diseases, endangering their health. Moreover, potential interactions between the tribe and miners entail catastrophic conflicts. The miners' practices, employing high-pressure hoses and mercury, devastate the land and contaminate the rivers. This contamination wreaks havoc on the flora and fauna, the tribe's sole source of sustenance. An alarming amplification of mercury-related health concerns looms over this tribe due to the pollutants. Consequently, venturing into their untouched realm might inadvertently catalyze their downfall, emphasizing the vital importance of safeguarding their isolation amidst lurking perils. At number 7 are the Sapanawa, residing in the uncontacted frontiers stretching across Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil. Existing within a region teeming with uncontacted tribes, making it a unique hub of human isolation. A tragic turn of events thrusts some Sapanawa into contact in 2014 when their homes fell victim to an outsider attack, leaving them with no choice but to connect with the outside world. This catastrophe was fueled by various factors including illegal lodgers, substance smugglers, and even heedless missionaries in the area. The consequences are dire. Not only do the outsiders disrupt their way of life, but they inadvertently carry diseases that these tribes lack immunity against. While we might harbor defenses, these tribes remain vulnerable. The complex web of issues reminds us of the delicate balance between preserving cultural isolation and addressing the grave threats that encroach upon it. At number 6 are the Toromona, 
The Toramona, indigenous to Bolivia, dwell near the upper Madidi River and Heath River in the Amazon Basin's northwestern region. Their isolation remains remarkably intact, barring interactions even with other indigenous groups. Notably, a Norwegian biologist's vanishing in 1997 sparked a widespread fascination with the tribe. Although sporadic sightings persisted, the Toramona's existence largely evaded verification. An intriguing account arises from the Araona people, who discussed encountering a group voluntarily detached from the world on the Manurivi River's eastern bank. Although unconfirmed, these individuals are widely believed to be the Toramona. Bolivia's move to safeguard these uncontacted tribes manifested in a 2006 administrative resolution that cordoned off a pristine zone within the Madini National Park. This refuge stands as a testament to the determination to preserve the Taramona's autonomy and secluded way of life. At number 5, the aforementioned Ayorio, indigenous to the Gran Chaco in Bolivia and Paraguay, present a complex story. About 5,600 years ago, Ayorio individuals exist today, with roughly 100 adhering to the traditional nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle, untouched by modern society. Their history is marked by both contact and isolation. See, back in the 1700s, Jesuits aimed to convert them to Catholicism, but left them alone after the mission's abandonment. Fast forward to the 1900s and the Chaco War introduced diseases and turmoil, portraying the Ario tribe as obstacles to both Bolivia and Paraguay. Soldiers were even encouraged to eliminate these tribesmen for their release. Missionaries' actions from the 1940s to the 1970s coerced Ario's from their land, eradicating their culture. The tragic event of 1986 exposed the perils of forced contact, and today, both contacted and uncontacted Aorios face threats like deforestation, territorial disputes, oil exploitation, and discrimination. Delving into these threats would be fascinating, but let's maintain our pace. At number 4, the Karafawiana people are an extremely small group of only 50 people who remain extremely uncontacted, and so information on this particular tribe is quite scarce. They're located within the Amazon regions of Brazil, so like many of the other tribes that live in that area, they're threatened by illegal lodging, oil companies, and destruction of their land. It's believed that they practice a religion that's based on the other living creatures and things around them, such as plants and animals. But the specifics of this religion remain a mystery. They are a nomadic group of hunter-gatherers, and it's unclear if they partake in any kinds of agriculture or horticulture. While it would of course be super interesting to know about this tribe and their people, it's kind of refreshing to hear about a tribe we know so little about because they have mostly been left alone. Of course, that doesn't mean the outside world has been great to them, but just less worse. At number three, the Mabuti tribe are an indigenous group in the Congo region of Africa. They are a contacted group, but they remain in voluntary isolation to continue their traditional ways of life. They are hunter-gatherers who see the forest as their protector. The forest is actually the basis for all of their mythology and spiritual beliefs, which is super cool. They live in villages, and each of these huts houses one family unit. They live in a fairly equal society, but they do have leaders, usually the men who are the best hunters. Despite remaining isolated, they do sometimes offer trades with outsiders and other indigenous tribes tribes. The Mbuti are threatened for a few reasons because their territory is unprotected. Not only are they no longer allowed to hunt large game on their own land because of deforestation, gold mining, and modern influences from plantations, agriculturists, and efforts to conserve the forest, their food supply is threatened. If that wasn't enough, they've also been targets of mass euthanization campaign, which is absolutely horrifying. At number two, the Deslala are an indigenous group of people in Brazil living under the lower Val do Javari in the western Amazon basin. These people are split into two groups, one splinter group led by a woman named Maya that's around 23 people, while the larger group is around 150. The split between these groups came from a dispute between around 20 members, and while the larger group remains quite isolated, the smaller group has had some infrequent contact with neighboring settlements. The hunting and war weapon of choice of this tribe is the club, but they're also known to use poison darts. Both the men and women of this tribe paint themselves with red dye that's made from plants. There's little that's known about their religious or spiritual practices, but it's known that they live in communities huts, which is something that's different from many of the uncontacted tribes in today's list. This tribe has a long history with the of indigenous people, so it makes sense that they want to remain isolated and have not welcomed outside contact very much since the 1950s. In 1996, there began expeditions to try and make peaceful contact, but this tribe are known to eliminate trespassers on their land, which we cannot truly blame them for, as the most recent known incident of this nature came in the year 2000, when three lumbermen were eliminated near the native reservation. At number one, the new cat are a tribe who live in the depths of the tropical forest, just on the fringe of the Amazon basin. They're nomadic hunter-gatherers, 
and they practice small-scale shifting horticulture. This tribe is a little different than the others on this list because of the fact that they aren't exactly considered uncontacted anymore. They were uncontacted up until about 1981 when they were contacted by the new tribe's mission, which is now called Ethnos 360. And since then, they've lost at least half of their tribe, mostly due to disease. Much of their territory has been used by coca growers, ranchers, and other settlers, as well as being occupied by guerrillas, army, and paramilitaries. Many of the new CACs still live their traditional lifestyles, but because of the growing threats to them, in 2006, a group of around 80 tribe members left the jungle to assimilate in an attempt to preserve their culture. One of the people in this group explained, we do want to join the white family, but we do not want to forget the words of the new cock. Coming in at number 10, we have the Chimbu Skeleton Tribe. One look at this tribe sends shivers down my spine, and if I saw them in the flesh, I would very much want to run away. It seems that the Chimbu tribe dressed this way for special festivals, including the Mount Hagen Festival. The paint was originally designed to psychologically intimidate enemies, and also to present themselves as superhuman. The tribe live in a remote mountainous region of Papua New Guinea, and first made contact with the connected world in 1934, although they do remain elusive, and to be honest, painted like that, I wouldn't want to run into them. I wouldn't want to mess with them. Coming in at number 9, we have the Asaro Tribe. Have a look at the Asaro Tribe. Usually, I wouldn't say you should ever judge people by the way they look, but when it comes to tribes, I would say, actually, if they look threatening, that's because they want to scare you. They want to scare you off, and like, maybe you should be scared off. What happens if you don't heed that warning? Do you really want to find out? The Asaro tribe are also known as the Asaro Mudmen because of their masks, which are made from mud. They're also hella spooky. The story behind the mud is that one time they approached an enemy after hiding out in a muddy bank. The enemy thought that they were spirits and fled. Would you like to see them in action? actually pretty harmless, but their masks do make me worry. Coming in at number 8, we have the Chukchi people. The reason this tribe are on this list is because they are the only tribe in Russia that were never conquered by the Russian people, which actually must mean that they're pretty terrifying and hardcore. Historically, Russia has waged war with the Chukchi people on many occasions over hundreds of years. While some of the tribe's people were killed, they were never actually defeated. These days, they live reasonably undisturbed in the Chukchi Peninsula. This is at the very north of Russia, parallel to the top of Alaska. It is cold up there. These people survive in those climates 24-7, and to be honest, to me, that makes them pretty hardcore and not to be crossed. Ah, a ghost at number 7, we have the Night Marchers. I really enjoy this, something different for this list. Often called the Night Marchers, the Hawakapo are ancient Hawaiian warriors that now are jobbed with escorting newly dead spirits into the afterlife. These are a more musical band of grim reapers. The Hawakapo are also known as torchbearers, and they walk across the land carrying you guessed it, torches, but also weapons and drums which they play and chant. There have been sightings of these ghostly torchbearers, but if you ever come across one, you must not look them in the eye, as they may mistakenly class you as someone who needs to be marched into the afterlife. That is, unless one of your relatives is in the tribe who can vouch for you. It's rules. Those are the rules. You know that the Hoakapo are nearby if you hear distant drumming in Hawaii, if you hear conch shell horns, see faint torchlight and smell faint foul odours. Rumours and reports of torchbearer sightings have been rife over the years and are absolutely ingrained in Hawaiian folklore. Unless you want to be marched down into heaven or hell or wherever they're going, I would say stay away from the tribe. Coming in at number 6, we have the Korubo or the Dasala tribe. The Korubo, also known as the Dasala tribe, are well known for their big clubs, as in big sticks. The Korubo are one of the most isolated tribes in the world and they do not want to be contacted. The tribe are visually scary to look at, they paint themselves with red dye made from from the Ruko plant. The tribe lives in the western Amazon basin and regularly have clashes with other local tribes. They use their clubs to beat people to death. They're also fond of the humble poison dart. The tribe are hostile to outsiders, and in recent history, they have beat to death three loggers and workers from FUNAI, a Brazilian government initiative to protect indigenous tribes. Coming into number five, we have the Surma tribe. The Surma live in the Bench Magi zone of the southern nations, nationalities, and peoples regions of Ethiopia. The tribe are particularly scary and dangerous, especially if you're an outsider like us, because instead of clubs, spears, or darts, the bands have automatic guns. 
Yikes. Guns aside for the moment, the tribe do have a tradition of beating one another with sticks as a rite of passage before they can officially become a man, so as you can gather, the Surma don't shy away from violence. While the Surma do have guns and are hostile to outsiders, there aren't actually any reported instance of them shooting anyone, so I guess while things may seem barbaric to us, who are we to judge them, they probably just want to do their own tribe business and let us leave them alone. Coming in at number 4 we have the Angori sect. The Angori sect are infamous for their morbid worship practices. Now, they use a corpse during their rituals and they often threaten to eat people. Have a watch of a CNN reporter interacting with them. Honestly, this freaked me out. Can you imagine being in this situation? People on that side of the river are so afraid of the Agori. <laughs> That's right, he actually said that I'd be terrified. The reporter then starts asking questions which are not met with a happy response. Have a listen. Why do you wow! I absolutely think I'd be bricking it. The sect are very secretive and they generally shy away from interactions with others and honestly, that's enough to make me want to stay away from them. Ok next up, not 100% a tribe but like a terrifying story and a terrifying jungle gang in Papua New Guinea. At number 3 we have the cargo cult. This is such a scary story. The story starts with Stephen Tarry, a man who gathered thousands of disciples in Papua New Guinea. He lured them into the jungle and encouraged them to be part of his sect. The man wore white robes and preached his own gospel while standing on a rock and calling himself, and I quote, Black Jesus. The cult lived in the jungle much like a tribe, and Tari was their leader. He would regularly lead ritual human sacrifice, which is repugnant. On one occasion, he slaughtered a virgin he called his flower girl and encouraged his following to drink her blood. One mother testified that she was made to drink her own daughter's blood. Now it seems that the tribe like cult turned against him, and actually, the leader was murdered himself in 2013. I guess he got what was coming to him. Ok, at number two, I've put a tribe you've probably heard heard of, I'm saving one at number one that you might not have heard of, getting a lot of press, we have the Sentinelese tribe. So you may have heard of this tribe in regards to the recent murder of John Allen Chow. He was a 26 year old American missionary who was sent by the All Nations group to make contact and live with amongst the tribe. Basically, they were hoping to convert them to Christianity, which really wasn't a good idea because they killed him. This is the theme with people who come too close to this tribe. Now the North Centennial Island is amid the Indian Ocean and has been home to the tribe for around 60,000 years. Until recently, the tribe has only been spotted through far off images. But people keep getting closer and closer to them these days and they don't like it. They've been known to fire arrows at low flying planes. It's hard to contact a tribe who have literally no interest in communication, but most of those who have tried just haven't lived to tell the tale. Some have met their fury by accident, for example in 2006 two fishermen who were illegally harvesting crabs were killed by the tribe. Now Chow, the missionary, is the most recent victim. He kept a journal of his attempts to contact the tribe and he sang songs and offered them the bible, but actually instead they shot and pierced the holy book with an arrow. I think this should have been a warning to him, but he persisted to no avail and was met with a mixture of laughter and hostility. In the end, it all got too much for the tribe who decided decided to kill him. He was last seen by the crew who went with him on the adventure. He was dragged away. They said they saw him dragged away and killed and they saw his lifeless body spotted on the shore. Gnarly. Finally coming into number 1 we have the Korowai tribe. The Korowai tribe are one of the most feared tribes in the world. They were only discovered in 1974 and since then encounters have been very limited. The tribe are based in Papua New Guinea and they are known to live in trees as to have a height advantage when intruders come into their space. They are known to shoot arrows at any trespassers and they believe that white people are actually possessed by ghosts or demons, so obviously as a white person wandering into this tribe, you can imagine what might happen to you. It is actually thought that the Korowai tribe killed Michael Rockefeller who disappeared after attempting contact in the 1960s. Some reports say that his body was seen amid the tribe on a beach. Now, In 2014, Australian journalist Paul Raphael visited the tribe and discovered that they do still very much eat 
hate people. That's right, they cannibalize the body of people who die under mysterious circumstances. Why? Because they think that they've been possessed by a kakua. A kakua basically is a bad, bad spirit. The logic is they must eat the kakua as the kakua ate the person who died. It's an act of revenge. Everything is eaten by the tribe except the hair, nails, and penis. Do you want to stumble across this tribe? Rather you than me. Going off number 10 now, we have the Sentinelese. These are the indigenous people of North Sentinel Island, located in the Bay of Bengal. They have resisted contact with the outside world for as long as the outside world has even known about them. They are a hunter gatherer population that have shown no signs of developing agriculture or even producing fire. In 1996, the Indian government ended all contact attempts following a series of hostile encounters, resulting in several deaths. In 2006 alone, two fishermen were killed by tribal archers there when their boats drifted too close to the island. The tribe's population is unknown. Next up at number 9 now, we have Survival International. That's not the name of the tribe, obviously. That's the name of the group that took these incredible pictures of an uncontacted tribe in the Brazilian Amazon. The helicopter was flying over a clearing near the Envira River when they saw this, a man and some children staring up at them in wonder. He's armed with a bow and arrow and covered in red paint made from the seeds of the Anato shrub. When the pictures were posted online on the group's website, they were being viewed thousands of times per minute, captivating people all over the world. Next up at number 8 now, we have the Man of the Hole. This is one man who lives alone in the Amazon rainforest and is believed to be the last surviving member of his tribe. Some people refer to him as the last tribesman or the loneliest man on earth, but he is known as the Man of the Hole because he makes holes. Wherever his abandoned homes are found, there is always a hole inside them, over 6 feet deep. It's thought he uses these holes to trap animals or for him to hide in. His existence wasn't even known until 1996. In 2007, the Brazilian government made an off-limits area around him. That area currently sits at over 42 square miles. In 2009, the man of the hole was attacked by gunmen, but is believed to have survived. Not much more is known about him. Alright, at number 7 now, we have the New Guinea tribes. Now These are a large number of different tribes on this Indonesian island that we know almost nothing about. One study found there are an estimated 44 uncontacted tribal groups there. Large parts of the area are unexplored by scientists and anthropologists because of all the difficult terrain. It seems to be the case there that local authorities are aware of where the tribes are, but not very much more than that. Very little is known about their language, population, and whether contact is even the right thing to push for. Moving on to number 6 now, we have the Awa. Also known as the Guaya, this indigenous group live in Brazil's eastern Amazon rainforest. Their population is thought to be around 350, spread out among a number of smaller subgroups. Now, about a hundred of those people have had no contact with the outside world. They are a nomadic group, which means they wander from place to place, a trait they appear to have developed to stay one step ahead of colonial Europeans. They have had serious conflicts with loggers, leading to massacres, with some accusing the Brazilian government of turning a blind eye. This led to one human rights organization to label them as Earth's most threatened tribe. Next up at number 5 now, we have the Javari Valley people. Now, this isn't their name. We don't actually know their name, but Javara Valley in Brazil is where an uncontacted tribe had a brutal run in with illegal gold miners. In September 2017, an estimated 10 members of the tribe were killed while gathering eggs along the valley's river. We only know this happened because the miners then went to a bar to brag about the killings, showing off a hand carved paddle as proof of their deed. The event caused outrage across the world, but for local activist groups trying to protect these local tribes, this sadly comes as no surprise. All right, at number 4 now, we have the Ao Rio. There are a number of different clans that make up the Ao Rio group, although they all originate from the Gran Chaco area that spans both Bolivia and Paraguay. Some of these clans have assimilated into the modern world around them, with notable problems for them, I might add, but some of them remain in voluntary isolation. It's thought there are about 100 uncontacted Ao Rio members, split into about 6 or 7 groups. They are actually the only uncontacted South American tribe not living in the Amazon. Next up at number 3 now, we have the Toromona. These are an uncontacted tribe living in northwest Bolivia. They have been known about for quite some time, but it wasn't until 2006 that the Bolivian government created an established zone of protection for them. There has not been a single non-native person to contact this tribe. This is quite surprising because many parts of Bolivia were settled by the Spanish during their colonization of the area. However, they found it difficult to settle in this particular area 
area of the Amazon and so the Toromona were free to develop on contacted. At the number 2 spot now we have the Yukui. This group of indigenous people from eastern Bolivia have been known about since the colonial era but in all that time contact has been hard to come by. For hundreds of years people thought the Yukui were actually part of another larger group known as the Siriono. So in 1960 an attempt to contact them was made by a Siriono speaker. When it failed anthropologists realised they were much more of a distinct group. As of today it's thought that the Yukui tribe consists of 49 families, 35 of which are contacted and 14 are not. And finally at number 1 now we have the Masco Piro. This group is one of Peru's 15 uncontacted tribes, but things may not stay the same forever. In November 2017 the Peruvian government announced plans to initiate contact with this tribe. The main reason for this is because the Masco Piro have been raiding other contacted villages, sometimes killing residents and pillaging their supplies. There is also the worry that tourists and companies may start making contact with them soon anyway. All of this means the government has decided to step in first and make official contact. At the time of recording this video it's yet to be seen if the contact will be successful. Starting off this countdown we have the cannibalism. A lot of people are under the impression that the Centralese people on this island are cannibals. Because of their hostility and unadvanced lifestyle people think they are completely wild. On a number of occasions trespassers have been killed by this tribe. Their bodies put on display before being buried never eaten. It's also believed that this theory was born after learning about the practices of a neighboring tribe. That tribe would cut up and burn the flesh of the deceased tribe members. This was said to prevent them from being consumed by evil spirits. But in 2006 a group of researchers studied the island and found no evidence that they practiced this deed. So it seems like this creepy theory is inaccurate. Moving on to number 9 we have the secret facility. Okay, this next theory is more on the wild side. It was posted by Reddit user SlyFry. According to them, they have a theory that North Sentinel Island is home to a top secret research facility, and the people on the island are protecting it. I mean, the Sentinelese are very violent, and they will kill anyone that comes close to their island. Maybe it's because they have to guard this secret facility with their life. I mean, it would be a good place for a secret facility, just because of how secret and protected the island is. And it would be the last place people would think a secret facility would be. That's just one crazy theory. It also could explain why the Indian government doesn't allow sharing of images taken of the Sentinelese or of the island. Moving on, at number 8 we have the fake shipwreck. In August of 1981 a Hong Kong freighter known as the Primrose ended up getting in a shipwreck a couple of meters away from the North Sentinel Island. As soon as this happened they were greeted by 50 locals with spears and arrows. They began launching attacks at the boat. The captain immediately made a desperate call for help asking for weapons to be airdropped so they could defend themselves. Thankfully the crew members were rescued by a helicopter and left uninjured. But the remains of the wrecked ship still remain near the island. Theory goes that this never even happened? A shipwreck never occurred and the ship was just placed there as a ploy to make the story more credible. Now why would they make this up? Well to make the story of this dangerous island more credible. Again to prevent outsiders from trespassing on the island. Either to keep the Sentinelese safe or to keep their top secret facility safe. In our 7th spot we have the tsunami. In 2004 a big tsunami struck the North Sentinel Island. When things settled a bunch of Indian Coast Guard helicopters flew over the island to see if they needed any help. They expected the worst outcome. But surprisingly everything was ok. They managed to survive this deadly tsunami. The question is how? Well that's when this theory comes in. Some believe that the Sentinelese were protected by amulets of ancestral bones. They sensed the storm was coming and went out and scattered pig and turtle skulls around their island. And in the end that is what protected them from this deadly storm. Coming in at number 6 we have the encounter. In 1991 a group of Indian anthropologists led by Mr. Pandit made peaceful contact with the Sentinelese. It started off with them bringing gifts for them like coconuts to show them they mean no harm. In fact there are some photos and videos of this team's interaction with the tribe and it's astonishing. The Sentinelese didn't seem afraid at all. So what happened? 
what changed their ways. I mean, in 1996, the Indian government banned any researchers from visiting the island. But what caused them to become more hostile towards outsiders again? Theory goes that between 1991 and 1996, something very bad happened. Like an encounter gone wrong. The government is scared of bringing outsider diseases to the island. Maybe that's exactly what happened, which led to the ban in 1996. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with John Allen Chow. In November of 2018, John Alan Chow believed with the power of God he would be able to convert the Sentinelese to Christianity and help them. He believed that this island was Satan's last stronghold on earth. He felt it was his mission to help them. So he went there from America and tried to make contact with them. John's first attempt at making contact with them didn't go as planned. As soon as he stepped foot on the island, several men came charging at him, firing arrows. So he fled. But on November 16th, he tried again. He got a fisherman to drop him off alone. And that was the last time anyone had seen him. They just assumed he had been taken captive by the locals and was killed. But his body was never recovered. In fact, they tried to recover his body a number of times, but have never been successful. Theory goes though that John is actually still alive and is living there with them in peace. According to anthropologist T. N. Pandit, who has encountered the group on a number of occasions, he has described them as being largely peace loving. But when they see someone new invading their territory, they get violent. But if Pandit was able to gain their trust and get close to them, maybe John actually was able to do the same. Who knows? According to a fisherman, he saw the tribe members dragging a dead body by a rope, but we don't know if that really was John's. Moving on, at number four, we have the government experimentation. Theory goes that the government is actually holding the Sentinelese captive there. This is all against their will. Why are they doing this? Well, theory goes that they are running a number of experiments on them, like how long they are able to sustain their hunter-gatherer lifestyle, or how long they can go living and repopulating with a small amount of people. Because in the end, there's not going to be a lot of genetic variety there. There have already been concerns about inbreeding going on. Maybe this is all done at the hands of the Indian government. In our third spot, we have the Malaysian Flight 370. On March 8th of 2014, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 disappeared without a trace. To this day, no one knows what happened to this flight and the 227 passengers and 12 crew members on board. But NVJDS on Reddit has a theory on the flight's disappearance. He thinks that the missing flight was purposely crashed onto North Sentinel Island. Since the island keeps everyone away, no one would go looking there for a plane and they wouldn't be able to even if they tried. As for why the plane was crashed there, I have no idea. But this kind of makes sense. Researchers that have tried to make contact with the island said the Sentinelese had new weapons made of metal. How could they get their hands on metal? Well, if a plane crashed there, they would have access to a lot of metal scraps, which was then used to make better spears and arrows. And in our second spot, we have the brainwashing. Okay, this is another pretty extreme and messed up theory, but as you know from Lindsay's earlier point, John Allen Chow went to North Sentinel Island to try and help the Sentinelese, a move that many think was dumb and pointless. But John was determined to bring Christianity to them. Theory goes that John was actually brainwashed and sent there on a mission on behalf of other missionaries. In 2017, during a boot camp missionary training, that's when he first got the idea to preach to the Sentinelese. Theory goes that something went down to that training, maybe the missionaries were all brainwashed with different missions, John's being to make connection to the tribe. And in our number one spot, we have Maurice Vidal Portman. This theory was shared on Twitter by the user Respectable Lawyer. They might have discovered why the Sentinelese people are so violent towards outsiders. Let's take a look at a man named Maurice Vidal Portman. Back in the day, Maurice was assigned to look over the Andaman Islands and the Andamanese, but he ended up kidnapping some locals and took disturbing photos of them. He also would treat them like objects and would measure every inch of them. Every inch. He had an unhealthy obsession with them. He did this up until 1880 when he started focusing on North Sentinel Island. 
He abducted an elderly couple there who soon passed away from outside diseases. So it's thought that he did the same thing to the Sentinelese people. And this is what caused them to become so defensive to outsiders. Because in the past, this creepy man abducted members of their tribe and ran tests on them. In the end, they are scared this will happen again. And we're starting off the list with the Vagongo statues. Vagongo statues are sacred wooden sculptures created by the Mijikenda people of Kenya, made not just to honor the dead, but are also said to hold the spirit of the deceased within them. They are an essential part of the burial rituals within the Mijikenda community, and one of the most important rules about these statues is that they cannot under any circumstances be moved from where they were erected. If this happens, it's a bad omen for the tribe. Droughts, premature deaths, the list goes on. This is because removing these memorial markers disrupts the spiritual harmony between the living and the dead, leading to a curse. The worst part about this is that it's not affecting the individual thieves or buyers, but the entire tribe or community from which these statues were taken. Some of these statues have found their way into the art market. They're often sold to collectors or displayed in museums both locally and internationally. Many argue that these artifacts should be returned to their places of origin and uh, they would be right. Sure, it's cool seeing these things in person, but is it worth tormenting an entire community of people over? I don't know, it doesn't really seem like a fair trade-off to me. Number nine, the Ring of Sinecianus, also known as the Vine Ring. This is an ancient Roman ring associated with a curse. It's said to have a curse inscribed right on it. The Latin inscription reads, Sinecianae vivas in diem, which translates to Sinecianus, may you live in God. The curse is believed to have been invoked by a man named Sylvanius who accused Sinecanius of stealing the ring. Sylvanius, seeking divine intervention, dedicated the curse to the god Nodens, a Celtic deity associated with healing and the sea, in an effort to recover the ring. The last known record places the ring at the Vine, a historic estate in Hampshire, England. The National Trust, which manages the Vine, displayed the ring for public viewing. The curse associated with the ring of Sicanus is thought to bring misfortune and suffering to anyone who possesses or wears the ring without rightful ownership. If this is reminding you at all of Lord of the Rings, by the way, you're not alone. The ring was definitely a part of J.R.R. Tolkien's inspiration for the story. Next up on the list is the Hope Diamond. The Hope Diamond is a famous blue diamond with a long and storied history. It is one of the most renowned gems in the world, known not only for its exceptional size and color, but also for the supposed curse associated with it. The Hope Diamond is currently housed in the National Gem and Mineral Collection at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. The diamond has been on display there since it was donated to the Smithsonian Institution by Harry Winston in 1958. The story begins when the diamond was stolen from an idol in India, though. According to the legend, the curse would bring misfortune and tragedy to anyone who possessed or wore the diamond. King Louis XIV and Marie Antoinette are two of the most notable historical figures believed to have possessed the Hope Diamond during their reigns. Both faced tragic ends. In 1839, Henry Thomas Hope purchased the diamond and gave it its name. His untimely death led his family to sell the gem to settle gambling debt. That's jeweler Wilhelm Falls acquired the Hope Diamond and shortly after died at the hands of his very own son, who then went on to take his own life. Evelyn Walsh McLean, an early 20th century owner, experienced a series of tragedies as well, including the premature deaths of her son and daughter, and then her husband left her, went insane, and eventually died. At our number seven spot, we have the unlucky mummy. Mummies one of the staples of museums. This mummy is believed to bring misfortune to those who come in contact with it. It's said to have been the cause of various unfortunate incidents throughout its history. I'll let you in on a little secret. That's how it got the name unlucky mummy. It was excavated from a tomb in Thebes during the 19th century, and because the tomb was fiddled with, disturbing the mummy's final resting place, often considered a taboo in ancient Egyptian culture. Really, it's Probably taboo to mess with anyone's tomb, I think. But anyway, a curse was said to be unleashed. Individuals who were associated with the excavation or possession of the unlucky mummy have experienced a series of unfortunate events, like dying, 
There have also been accidents and financial ruin, which this mummy was said to be responsible for. The mummy has been on display in the British Museum since 1889. Number six, the woman from Lem. The woman from Lem is an archaeological artifact, a small limestone statue representing a woman. The story goes that it will bring misfortune and death to those who possess it. The woman from Lem is believed to have originated from a burial site in Lem, Cyprus, dating back to around 3500 BC. The origins of this thing are pretty murky, which just makes it even more mysterious and eerie. It's currently on display in the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. The curse is said to affect those who come into contact with the statuette, leading to a series of unfortunate events, including illness and death. And just like with any ancient cursed object, the bad stuff started happening when it was taken from its original location. Accidents, financial ruin, and premature death have been said to plague those who have interacted with the object, which is why the woman from Lem has earned its nickname as the Goddess of Death. At our number five spot, we have the Catskills Crone. About seven years ago, a pair of hikers were traversing the Catskill Mountains in New York State when they came across an old looking statue in a cave. The object had nails driven into its eyes and a rope around its neck. They decided to bring the thing home with them for some reason, and things got weird. They began finding muddy footprints that would randomly appear in their home, and at one point, they even saw the apparition of a ghostly hag. They posted their experience on Reddit, hoping to gain some insight, and one of the folks who chimed in, known as Newkirk on Reddit, is the director of a museum specializing in cursed objects, and this is what he had to say. Hey everyone, you guys might remember that about six months ago there was a post in the sub from a hiker who claimed that he and a friend found a strange carving in a New York cave. Long story short, they took it home and boom, bad haunting, poltergeist activity, apparition, and wet footprints manifesting along with a strong scent of pond water. A full-blown haunting, if he was to be believed. There were lots of great responses in the thread, and after getting a few emails from friends who know what I do for a living, I logged in and threw my two cents into the ring. I'm the director of a paranormal and occult museum based out of Cincinnati, and he ended up sending the item to me. Half a year later, I can say with a good amount of certainty that the carving, which we've nicknamed the crone, is definitely haunted. I don't say things like that lightly, but within hours of the object arriving at my office, I'm fairly certain it pulled Jesus off a crucifix hanging on the wall, was the cause of phantom knocks, wet footprints on my couch, and we even caught it moving with a motion-activated camera. The last straw was when it tried to drop a television on my head. Next up is the Koh Noor Diamond. This is a highly famous diamond with a long and storied history. Originally mined in India, the diamond has changed hands multiple times over centuries. Right now, the Koh Noor Diamond is part of the British Crown Jewels and is set in the front of the Queen Mother's Crown. It's on display in the Tower of London. There are tons of tales of the bad stuff that's happened to those who have had this diamond in their possession, specifically men. The diamond Diamond brings misfortune to male owners while bringing good fortune to female owners. It was in possession of various rulers, including the Maghals, the Persian rulers, and the Sikh Maharajas before being seized by the British East India Company in the mid-19th century. The Kohonor was presented to Queen Victoria in 1850, and since then, it's been part of the British crown jewels. And number three are the Maori warrior masks. Maori warrior masks, originating from the indigenous Maori people of New Zealand, are traditional artifacts that hold cultural and spiritual significance. These masks were created created for the specific rituals and ceremonies, often serving as representations of ancestors and embodying spiritual power. So, when these masks are removed from their sacred settings, it's said to disrupt the spiritual balance and invoke misfortune on the people possessing or displaying them. The curse is thought to bring bad luck, illness, or even death to individuals or institutions that have acquired the masks without proper cultural respect. Some claim that returning the masks to their place of origin is a way to break the curse. In at number two is the Black Orlov Diamond. The Black Orlov Diamond, also known as the Eye of Brahma, has a history steeped in tales of misfortune. Its origins trace back to India, where it was believed to be part of a larger diamond known as the Eye of Brahma, set in a sacred idol in a temple. Legend has it that a monk, in defiance of the sacred setting, stole the diamond from the idol, leading to a series of tragedies and untimely deaths. The diamond was eventually cut into three pieces to dispel the curse. One of these pieces became 
became the Black Orlov, named after its owner, Princess Nadia Vegan Orlov. A series of misfortunes are said to have befallen its subsequent owners. Tales of people taking their own lives, financial ruin, and tragic deaths circulated. I think what I've learned from this list is that diamonds are bad, okay? Finally though, we have the cursed Assyrian stele. This is an ancient artifact that was split into two pieces. One piece was found in 1879 in Syria and now sits in the British Museum. The other went to the Bonhams Auction House in London. The British Museum had an opportunity to purchase the other half in 2014, but they decided against it. This lower half, which was up at auction, didn't have a whole lot of information behind it. It wasn't said how the stele left Syria, just that it had been gifted from father to son in the 1960s. So this led to some speculation that the artifact may have been taken illegally from its home country. Mm, I wonder if that's true. There's also a curse inscribed onto the stele, which may have also been a factor in not wanting to unite the two halves. The inscription translated to English reads, whoever discards this image from the presence of Salmanu puts it into another place, whether he throws it into water or covers it with earth or brings and places it into a taboo house where it is inaccessible. May the god Salmanu, the great lord, overthrow his sovereignty. May his name and his seed disappear in the land. May he live in a contingent together with the slave woman of his land. Mm -hmm.